All right, Dr. Johnson here. I just got through doing a presentation for, let me bring it up here for you, for uh, the continuing medical education program at Williamsport Hospital. And we kind of had some technical issues. It didn't go as well as I wanted to, just in terms of like I had to rush, I felt I had to rush through things. Uh, and so what I would like to do here is um, do the presentation again, essentially, a little bit slower with a little bit more detail. Um, and I'm just going to post this to YouTube for anybody to look at. Uh, but it is still April 2nd. I just got through doing it. So I'm just going to kind of do it again while it's all fresh on my memory. The topic of the presentation was how to detect medical pseudoscience. Um, and what I was, who I was presenting to, of course, is a bunch of medical professionals, right? Um, and so in a certain kind of way, I'm, I'm preaching to the choir. But uh, the goal uh, is to help uh, medical professionals, uh, the goal of that presentation was to kind of help medical professionals uh, detect pseudoscience, be aware of pseudoscience that they hadn't uh, seen before. If they come across something new, be able to kind of detect um, that it is pseudoscience and be able to engage with their patients a little bit better uh, when they bring pseudoscience to them uh, so that they maybe have some resources and some arguments and some knowledge uh, to be able to debunk that pseudoscience uh, more readily instead of kind of like being what like, a doctor could be in a position where the you know a patient just brings in this new thing um, that maybe kind of sounds convincing or something initially or whatever, uh, and if they're not aware that it's pseudoscience, they're not able to tell that it's pseudoscience. Um, may have difficulty engaging with their patients. And so it's kind of geared at that. But um, it also will be useful as part of the reason I want to do it on YouTube here um, is uh, useful for everybody to be able to detect pseudoscience and be able to debunk it. So uh, when I'm talking to the internet, I am certainly not preaching to the choir in the kind of way that I, would, I am preaching to the choir. Um, I am preaching to the choir whenever I, you know, talk to a bunch of medical professionals about medical pseudoscience. Um, and so I just want to do the presentation here uh, and, uh, Hopefully this will be this will be helpful for doctors and non-doctors alike. All right. So I started off, of course, with, with a disclaimer, making clear that the following is my informed opinion based on my research and expertise. Um, when I say something doesn't work or is demonstrably false, what I mean is that there is no clinical repeatable evidence that shows that it has any measurable health effects. That is, in my opinion, reputable, right? Uh, lots of things have studies, but in my opinion, they are not reputable studies. And I'm, you know, uh, I, in my, if you apply the scientific criteria and that kind of stuff, what makes a good study, the studies aren't good. All right. So what is a pseudoscience? Well, as the name implies, a pseudoscience is something that presents itself as established scientifically, when in reality, it is actually not scientifically uh, based. Uh, usually it is demonstrably false. Um, in medicine, this includes medical misinformation and treatments for injuries or cures or for diseases that are not actually effective, right? Um, nice example over here on the right about how, you know, scientific, uh, scientific evidence that smoking is good or whatever, that was, that was pseudoscience. Even at the time, it was pseudoscience. Um, here are some uh, examples that your patients are likely occur to occur if you are a doctor, if you're a medical professional, um, but ov obviously that you are likely to occur to 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 uh, uh, to your to come across uh, in the real world. So in alphabetical order, there's alternative cancer treatments like German New Medicine, which says that every disease is caused by a shock experience, so healing can only occur after the conflict has been resolved. Um, there's laetril, I believe I'm saying that right, a substance that is toxic and has been shown not to work to cure cancer. Um, and then there's coffee enemas, which are exactly what you think they are. Uh, and of course, the truth about these things is they do not actually cure cancer. Um, if you're curious, I will make this PowerPoint available on my... Um, on my academia.edu page. I will post this PowerPoint there. Everywhere you see one of these uh, yellow underlined words. These are links to uh, research and articles that back up the claims that I'm making. So each one of these, German New Medicines debunked here, uh, Laetrile as a cure for cancers uh, debunked here, coffee enemas are debunked here. Uh, and so you can follow any of the links that you find in this PowerPoint to find more information and actual robust argument um, that these things are, 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 are pseudoscience or whatever claim I'm making uh, will be backed up with that information. Another piece of pseudo pseudoscience is anti-GMO alarmism. The claim they claim that their genetically modified food is harmful uh, in some kind of way. Um, 
not to say that Monsanto is a is a you know has never done anything wrong or anything like that, but generally GMOs are safe and their use of safe count their use has saved countless lives. Uh, like with golden rice in India, that was a GMO food that saved countless lives, millions of lives in India. Um, and so um, the anti GMO alarm, anti GMO alarmism is pseudoscience. There's applied kinesiology. Now it's important to note this is not actual kinesiology. Kinesiology is not a pseudoscience. Kinesiology is fine. Um, but there's this other thing called that borrows the name kinesiology to make itself sound scientific when it's not called applied kinesiology. Uh, they claim that changes in muscle strength reveal the sensitivities and needs of the patient. Supposedly the changes, supposedly the changes in strength are provided by probing questions or substances placed within the body's energy fields. Uh, and then tests are performed by asking questions and pushing on the outstretched arm to see how you know, strong the muscle is. And this is their diagnosis, uh, you know, their, their diagnostic uh, um, practice. The truth is that testing muscle strength can reveal little besides the actual strength of a muscle, right? Uh, you're not gonna be able to diagnose diseases um, with these kinds of things. Um, there's aromatherapy and essential oils. Uh, various health benefits come from certain oils that produce different scents. That's the claim that is made. Uh, the truth, in my opinion, people make a lot of money off selling them, but they have no measurable health benefits. Um, and here's some uh, articles uh, uh, debunking aromatherapy. Uh, and even though essential oils have essentially, not essentially, have been debunked, they are still used by paramedics in some ambulances. And so this is actually a really good example of where even in the scientific medical community, pseudoscience can kind of creep in uh, uh, and, and get in there um, and, and be used and get an air of legitimacy because paramedics use it, but it doesn't mean it's actually legitimate science. Uh, it just means the paramedics have fallen for pseudoscience. There's AIDS and HIV denial. The claim here is either that, they, they claim either that HIV doesn't exist or that it does exist, but it's harmless or it doesn't cause AIDS, or if it does, AIDS is not a big deal and can be cured with natural remedies. Um, comes in a lot of varieties. The truth, of course, is that HIV causes AIDS, which is a serious life-threatening disease, which compromises the immune system. There's chelation therapy. Another pseudoscience, uh, a series of intravenous infusions containing disodium. The claim is that a series of intravenous infusions containing disodium, EDTA, and various other substances can treat uh, ethereal sclerosis. Sorry, I don't have good practice saying that one. A uh, coronary heart disease and peripheral vas vascular disease and arthritis and multiple sclerosis and Parkinson's disease, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there's a lot that it's, it claims that it can cure. The truth of course is that it does not cure those things. Um, there's uh, chiropractic. Now this one's tricky because some uses of chiropractic are fine, others are not. So when J.D. Palmer founded chiropractic, it was undoubtedly a pseudoscience. Uh, based on one case, he cracked somebody's neck and then supposedly they could, their hearing was cured. They were deaf and they cracked their neck and they could hear again. Based on that one case, he concluded that all disease was caused by subluxations blocking the flow of innate intelligence through the body. Uh, neither of these things actually exist. Uh, chiropractic largely resisted scientific correction or quality control. Uh, but in some circles, correction was accepted. And so today, some chiropractic is science-based. Um, in short, one of my students who's going into chiropractic described this to me as there's philosophic and scientific, and the philosophic is going to be the one that's uh, pseudoscience, although I object to them, the pseudoscientists using the word philosophic. I do not like that. But because um, philosophy is not pseudoscience. Uh, philosophy encourages you to be able to recognize pseudoscience. Philosophy embraces scientific thinking. Uh, in short, if your patient or you are seeing a chiropractor to treat a muscular skeletal issue, it's probably science-based, not a problem there. If you are seeing, if they are seeing one to treat or cure a disease, uh, that is not going to be scientifically based. Chiropractic adjustments cannot cure diseases or, or treat those kinds of ailments. Um, here are four articles from Science-Based Medicine about what good science-based chiropractic can do and you know, what non what, what the bad uh, pseudoscientific chiropractic um, cannot do and some of the gimmicks they use. And there's a nice article on gimmickry and that kind of stuff there. Okay. Um, there's copper rod cold treatment. 
the claim here is that you can stick a copper rod up your nose to prevent the common cold. Um, the truth is that while copper does have antimicrobial properties, it can be good for piping if you want to, you know, to, to, to make sure that your, your water is not, uh, does not have viruses and uh, live viruses and bacteria in it, um, or countertops and that kind of stuff. The viruses will die quicker on, on copper countertops. Uh, there is no evidence that putting a copper rod up your nose can prevent the common cold or do anything else. Um, that's not quite how things work. So um, that copper rod, uh, copper rod cold treatment uh, is, uh, in my opinion, pseudoscience. Um, deer antler spray. The claim here is that ingesting IGF-1, which is derived from deer antler velvet, the tissue found inside a deer's antlers before they fully harden, will improve your athletic performance. Uh, the truth is that that kind of claim is untestable. Improves performance is not really something that can be tested, and it actually does nothing. There's a particular kind of fallacy that's involved here that's interesting, but uh, we'll talk about that in a bit, actually, when we talk about some of the red flags. Uh, there's detoxing. This comes in a lot of different varieties. The claim is that toxins are contained and can be removed from your body by various methods, like colonic hydrotherapy and colon cleansing or foot baths. Uh, and of course, the truth is that that is not true. These are gimmicks that you often involve tricks. So for example, a lot of uh, uh, these colon cleanses are little things that you eat and it's actually got kitty litter in it. And so when it gets into your intestines, it kind of builds up in a way and it makes your poop look gross, right? Because uh, it had kitty litter in it, uh, but it's not actually removing any kind of toxins uh, from you. In fact, sometimes it can be deadly. We'll talk about that. Um, these uh, foot detoxes, basically you put stuff in the water that eventually turns it a different color uh, and it makes you think there's toxins coming out of your feet when there's not. Um, there's ear candling, uh, the claim that you can clean your ears by lighting a special kind of hollow candle in your ear. Uh, the truth about this is that you can't. Uh, the candle, these, these special kind of wax candles, whatever, they don't create a vacuum to suck stuff out of your ear and you can actually injure yourself by trying to do this. Um, so don't do it. Um, energy healing. This comes in a bunch of different varieties. Um, the claim is that different types of objects and or touching techniques, crystals, chakra, reiki, rolfing, biofields, they either contain, amplify, attract, or repel different kinds of energy, the manipulation of which can cure disease. Uh, the truth is that the supposed, the supposed energy does not actually exist, and these methods only have the power of placebo. Um, again, here are a few uh, links that debunk uh, each one of these, uh, these claims, crystal healing, biofield. The biofield healing is actually tuning fork, like you strike a tuning fork and there's something that you're supposed to do and realign the body's energy fields and that kind of stuff. Um, all of that's debunked there. There's folk and herbal remedies. Uh, the claim here is that combinations of herbs, common or household items can cure various conditions. Um, few, if any of these folk remedies uh, or herbal remedies actually work. Uh, maybe a few do a, a little bit or something, but you'd have to look into all of them. But uh, here's a nice article on those kinds of things if you wanna look at what works and what doesn't. But most of them do not work at, at, at best, only a few do. Um, then there's goop. Gwyneth Paltrow has this health lab and they sell a bunch of different various products, one of which is supposedly a candle that smells like her vagina. Uh, and they make all kinds of various health claims about their health benefits and that kind of stuff. There's a Netflix show on goop and it involves some kind of psychic stuff in the last episode, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, it's, it's all hokery. It's all pseudoscience. They all these claims and products lack any kind of evidence of efficacy. Um, it's uh, kind of ridiculous uh, as what it is, but uh, it makes millions of dollars. Um, homeopathy. The claim here is that diluted forms of a substance that cause symptoms can cure those same symptoms. So the idea is if you have substance X and it causes a headache, if you dilute it and dilute it, dilute it into non-existence, then that diluted substance at the end, that diluted concoction you have at the end will cure headaches. Uh, that's the basics of it. Um, the truth is, is that is not true. Uh, no, that cannot work. That defies science uh, to think that diluting something reverses and then intensifies its effects. No, it just reduces its effects. Um, in all clinical trials, uh, uh, the, the homeopathy does no better than placebo. Um, so here's my fun play on words. If you think diluting something can reverse and then intensify that thing's effects, you are only diluting yourself. Um, Homeopathic remedies can be bought at CVS alongside actual medicine. This is where kind of, you know, pseudoscience has crept in. Uh, a good example of this is infant cough medicine. Um, for infants, you really can't give them like actual medicine that 
really does something because they're they're too young, right? Um, but so homeopaths have slipped in and have like you know infant cough medicine that you can buy at CVS that does nothing. It does nothing for their cough. Um, but uh, other than any, well, not even placebo could work. Placebo is not going to work on a baby. Um, but uh, you might think it works because the placebo effect can work on you so that you might think they're coughing less after you give it. Um, but um, in clinical trials and stuff, again, homeopathy that works no better than placebo. Um, but uh, this is an example of where uh, pseudoscience has crept into, you know, alongside, literally on the shelf, alongside real medicine. There's kinesio tape. Uh, the claim here is that it improves athletic performance by microscopically lifting the skin to increase blood flow. Um, the truth is that that is not the case. That's actually impossible to lift your skin in that kind of way to increase blood flow. Kind of like pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps. Um, it's just stretchy colored tape. It looks cool. Kind of looks cool. Um, it will do whatever just ordinary athletic tape does. Like if you tape up an ankle, like you would with regular athletic tape with kinesio tape, it will do the same thing that regular tape does. And it'll look a little cooler because it's bright, um, but it won't do anything else. Um, doing these kinds of, the way you're supposed to use it is scraping across the back or whatever, and it lifts your skin to increase blood flow. That does not, um, it does not do that. No, uh, uh, no reliable evidence, repeatable reliable evidence has shown any kind of efficacy for these things. Um, spas, spas make a number of different health claims, massage therapy, uh, hollow therapy and other spa services are claimed to provide and have various health benefits. Uh, the truth is, granted, they can be very relaxing. Massage is awesome, very relaxing. Such services have no measurable health benefits. Um, so here's massage therapy, hollow therapy, great article on trigger points. Like if you have a tight muscle spot and they, whatever, um, if there's toxins in there or whatever, I, I, um, there, there's articles about those kinds of claims uh, there. Um, Magnetic therapy. This is the claim that magnets can cure just about anything uh, by manipulating energy, uh, your energy fields, or sometimes the claim is like, you'll, they'll put like a magnet in a bracelet and then say that increases blood flow because it attracts the iron uh, in your blood. A um, couple things wrong with that. One, if it could attract your the iron in your blood, um, putting a magnet on your wrist would only make the iron in your blood collect in your wrist. It wouldn't actually increase blood flow. And secondly, if a little tiny magnet inside your inside a little bracelet could attack, attract the iron in your blood uh, and do anything affected at all, anybody who went into an MRI machine, which is essentially a giant super magnet, would die because it would they would die because they would pull all the iron out of your blood right through your body. Uh, so um, obviously that's nonsense. You cannot affect the iron in your blood with magnets. Um, so the truth is, is that using them has no health benefits. Uh, Anti-mask. Uh, Anti-masking, uh, like with COVID, the claim here is that masks do nothing to help prevent the spread of respiratory diseases like COVID. Uh, the truth, of course, is that they do. Uh, proof that they work has come from the CDC. And here's an article from PNAS. Um, I personally debunked an anti-mask argument back in July of 2020. Uh, if you want to see, that's like 10,000 words. Um, it's it's pretty robust because there were a lot of mistakes made in the argument. Uh, but if you're interested in there, there's my article there from ResearchGate. You can, you can look at that there. Um, Orthomolecular medicine or megadosing. Uh, this is the claim that poor nutrition is the cause of most disease. The cure is good nutrition. Uh, this usually involves the claim that megadoses of supplements can treat diseases. Um, the truth is that while poor nutrition can cause or contribute to some diseases or conditions like some versions of diabetes, right? Um, it does not cause most disease. And so it cannot be used to treat most diseases. Some diseases can be affected by your diet Sure, but not most of them. And in addition, megadosing vitamins mainly just makes expensive urine. Uh, it does not actually do anything like in terms of health benefits. Uh, with a with a modern Western diet, everybody gets the amount, the amount of vitamins that they need basically um, uh, from just a regular food that they eat. Um, certain exceptions by like, by if you don't get enough sunlight, you might need to take some vitamin D or something like that. But mega dosing stuff does nothing. Uh, even mega dosing vitamin D is not gonna do anything. Um, yeah. Uh, magic bracelets. The claim here is that bracelets with new advanced technology have medical and or performance benefits. Uh, the truth of course is that they don't. Uh, Q-ray bra bracelets do not relieve pain uh, and uh, power balance bracelets don't do anything. They basically just have like a little holographic sticker uh, in them and they kind of look a little cool, but they don't actually have any benefits. Um, reflexology. 
Uh, the claim here is that you can treat internal organs by pressing on designated spots on the feet and hands. Uh, and the truth is that this is physiologically impossible, uh, so it is not true. Um, you cannot do anything for your stomach cancer uh, by massaging the middle of your foot. Uh, there's therapeutic touch. The claim here is that you can heal disease by moving your hands near a patient to manipulate their energy field. Uh, the truth is that there is no such thing as such an energy field and that this was debunked by an 11-year-old at a science fair. Uh, they she did a very nice double-blinded study uh, and showed that people who were doing therapeutic touch couldn't tell the difference between there being an energy field and there being no person at all. And, yeah. uh, and yet it is still used by some nurses, which is a bit disturbing, uh, but true. Then there's traditional or ancient Chinese medicine. This is the claim that many different techniques, including acupuncture, moxibustion, cupping, can manipulate qi and provide health benefits. Uh, the truth is that no such techniques, including acup acupuncture, moxibustion, and cupping, work any better than a placebo. Uh, it also, interestingly enough, isn't traditional or ancient. It was invented and promoted by Chairman Mao. Um, so as a kind of like uh, long story there, but you can see the article there if, you, if you're interested in that. Uh, and chi does not actually exist as a real thing. Um, there's urine therapy. Uh, the claim here is that drinking your urine has many health benefits. Uh, the truth is that at best, it would keep you alive a couple of extra days in the middle of the Sahara, Sahara Desert by staving off, by staving off a, a, a dehydration. But other than that, it doesn't have any other benefits uh, unless you like to smell stinky and it would make you smell stinky. Um, and then of course, the piece de resistance of uh, medical pseudoscience, uh, vaccine denial. Uh, the claim here is that vaccines are ineffective and or they cause illnesses and conditions uh, like autism. Um, the truth is of course, is that safe, the vaccines are safe and effective. Uh, the side effects of vaccines are extremely rare and are greatly outweighed by the benefits uh, uh, that they have. Um, all right, so those are some common pseudosciences that you've uh, come that you would come across in the real world. If you're a doctor, your patients might be bringing these to you, uh, suggesting that these things are true or that they want to try this kind of thing instead of the treatment that you're suggesting, etc. Um, uh, if you're just out in the world, these are things that you come across uh, in uh, on the internet. Uh, you will see advertisements for things like this um, on uh, television stations, especially you know, uh, cable news pro, cable news stations, uh, and that kind of stuff. Lots of pseudoscience promoted um, uh, on, on television and online. You come across these things a lot. So I think it's important to recognize, be able to recognize a pseudosciences, right? So like, cause this list is not extensive, right? It's not, it is extensive, but maybe it's not, it's not all inclusive. There are things that, that could come across that, you, that we don't talk about here and uh, new ones what will pop up that I can't talk about here because they haven't been invented yet. And so I think it's important to be able to recognize pseudoscience so you can avoid it, right? Now, and I think this is important. Now, some people will argue that it's not important because they argue, well, what's the harm, right? What's the heart of a little medical pseudoscience? At worst, it does nothing, right? So it's not really harming anything. And at best, it at least has a little bit of a placebo effect. So you're getting some benefit from the pseudoscience because you might get a little placebo benefit, you know, a little, little, little placebo effect out of it, right? So, so what's the harm? What's the big deal about medical pseudoscience? Well, the answer is that it actually does plenty of harm. And there's basically kind of four ways you can divide this harm into kind of four categories. Um, for one, it's costly. It can cost you a lot of money. Uh, Kevin Trudeau, for example, uh, the author of Natural Cures They Don't Want You to Know About, um, swindled people out of millions before he was eventually put in jail for promoting pseudoscience, basically making false medical claims and bilking people out of money. I think there's some pyramid schemes involved in that kind of stuff. I'm not sure I have to look that up. Um, I think there was a pyramid scheme involved in, in his conviction. Um, but uh, yeah, he's in jail now uh, because he swindled millions out of money using pseudoscience, right? Like using, promoting pseudoscience, he's swindled people out of money. So it can cost you. That's one important thing that you wanna do that you wanna try to avoid is people just taking your money uh, for something that doesn't work. The placebo effect that it can generate, that it's supposedly that is its benefit. Well, that placebo effect is only psychological. It doesn't have any actual physiological effects. It's only psychological. Um, and because of that, it can trick people into forgoing legitimate treatments. Like if they take a pseudoscientific treatment and they think they feel better because of the psychological of the placebo effect, they might not think they actually need a legitimate treatment and then they end up dying from a preventable disease uh, because they thought they felt better because they took a placebo. 
Uh, proponents also, proponents of pseudoscience also fool people into thinking that legitimate treatments don't work or are dangerous, right? So like for anti-vaxxers, right? Uh, Anti-vax is definitely a pseudoscience. They have convinced people not to get vaccinated. And then we see resurgences of whooping cough, resurgences of vaccine preventable diseases. And of course, as I'll mention a little bit later, it's gonna, it's threatening uh, uh, herd immunity for COVID, right? People not getting vaccinated um, at the insistence of the anti-vax crowd. And then it can actually do direct harm because this, the pseudoscientific treatments themselves can be harmful and even kill people. Uh, like chiropractic adjustments on infants, that is not a safe thing to do. Do not crack your baby's yet formed bones. Uh, here's actually an example of a number of harms of pseudoscientific quackery. Um, Lori Aiken was a 17-month-old 17, 17 infant who was fed an organic vegetarian diet and treated with herbal and homeopathic remedies and an energy medicine instead of getting vaccines and normal medications, and she died. And she was essentially, when the paramedics finally showed up, she looked like a doll uh, uh, at death. Um, there was Makisha Dantis, who died at three months because of a folk remedy uh, for her fever and diarrhea. That folk remedy was alcohol, salt, water, and sugar. Uh, and she died um, uh, of, of, of remedy uh, for her fever and, and, and diarrhea. Um, but she died as a result of that, that, that folk remedy um, because it, like, she had something wrong with her uh, and it didn't get better with the folk remedy. Um, Naji was a four-year-old who died of flu when his mother didn't give him the prescribed Tamiflu and insist, insisted instead he be treated with vitamins, biotanicals, and fruits and vegetables. Uh, Christy Biddenbaugh uh, treated a sinus infection with chiropractic. The, the neck manipulation that she got caused a stroke and she died. Uh, Laverne Burrell died as a result of a colon cleanse. Again, usually the colon cleanse is just kitty litter um, that collects in your intestines and then it gets pooped out. Um, but it can actually, like it can do damage to you uh, uh, and you can end up uh, dying as a result. Not common, but it can happen. Um, 51 South Africans died from kidney failure caused by a folk remedy. Vaccine denial has caused disease resurgence and is threatening herd immunity for COVID, as I mentioned before. There are literally hundreds of similar cases that have been documented at, I believe the website address is what's the harm.net, which I think that was my, yeah, what's the harm.net has got the, uh, as the link there for the list of places, uh, the list of cases where this kind of thing has happened. Now, in objection to all of this, the, given the harms of quackery, some people will argue, well, what about malpractice? That, that you know, real medicine does harm too, right? Um, and so like, you know, why, you know, why, why, why single out pseudoscience as being harmful, right? Real medicine is harmful too. Of course, real medicine comes with its own risks. There are malpractice. The last talk I gave uh, for the Williamsport Hospital was about trying to avoid mis misdiagnosis. Um, that does happen. But the thing is, is everything is risky. Everything comes with risk. But we gauge our, Ashken, we gauge our actions about whether we should participate in risky behavior on a risk versus benefit. Is it actually worth the risk? And if it is, we should do it. And if it's not, it's not. Use it. We shouldn't. If it is if it is worth the risk, we should do it. If it's not worth the risk, we shouldn't. Using science-based medicine is like crossing the street at a crosswalk to pick up a hundred dollar bill, right? Yeah, it's possible you'll get hit. You'll cross at a crosswalk. There's cars around. Maybe you'll get hit. That's a possibility. But there are safeguards to try to prevent that kind of thing, and the risk is kind of worth it because you got a hundred bucks at the end, right? Um, using pseudoscience is like crossing an interstate to pick up a piece of lint on the other side the likelihood of getting injured is higher and there is no payoff at the end, right? Um, and so, yeah, they're both risky, but saying that they're equally risky or that means that they should be treated equally commits the fallacy of false equivalence. It's trying to make two things that are not equivalent seem equivalent uh, when, they're, okay, when they're not. Now, another reason for thinking that we don't need to be able to learn to, how to distinguish uh, between science and pseudoscience is that we can just rely on common knowledge. Um, we, we, just kind of, we can just kind of know these things and they're just things that we know out there. And so we know that's pseudoscience and it's not. Well, it turns out we can't do that because common knowledge, common knowledge is not actually that reliable. A lot of the things that we think we know, we don't actually know because they're false. Um, all of these are links to particular articles that debunk these claims. 
So we all think we know. These are all just things that everybody thinks they know. That sugar makes makes kids hyperactive. That you lose most heat out of your uh, through your head. That you should drink at least eight glasses of water a day. That chewing gum takes seven years to pass through your system. That cracking your knuckles will cause arthritis. That back pain should be treated with bed rest. That eating turkey makes you sleepy because it contains tryptophan. Uh, that eating at night makes you fat. That brain cells can never grow back. That it's harder to lose weight than gain weight. That you should pee on a jellyfish sting. That you go to sleep. You, you should don't go to sleep if you've had a concussion. That people only use ten percent of their brains. That coffee sobers you up, that your heart stops when you sneeze, that you should feed a cold and starve a fever, that cold, wet weather causes colds and flu, that shaving hair causes it to grow back faster, darker, and coarser, that ulcers are caused by stress, that you should stretch before exercising. These are all things I know that you have heard at one time or another and probably believed. I believed most of these things at one point in my life or another. All of them are false but they're all things that most people just think and assume they know as common knowledge or true when they're not. You can't rely on common knowledge uh, as a reliable guide to anything, much less what is or is not pseudoscience. Now, can't I just tell by looking? No, for a couple of reasons. If you're a medical professional, you'll probably be a little bit better at telling by looking than other people but perhaps only because you're already aware of some of the things that I'm about to, to put forth. Um, but even if you're a medical professional, you can still be led astray. So the reason why is because the looking by knowing method usually involves just dismissing what is not already accepted, right? So you see something that goes against the grain that is not what medical professionals or, or what, what, you know, what, what, what most people expect or what people have been saying or what you think is common knowledge or whatever. It goes against the grain in a certain kind of way. You say, oh, that must be pseudoscience because that contradicts something that I think that I already know. Well, it turns out that, I mean, fairly, really, if you do that, usually you'll be right. Usually what cuts against the grain and goes against what we think we know, usually that turns out to be a pseudoscience. But very occasionally, conventional wisdom is wrong. Uh, Einstein was essentially considered a pseudoscience at first because he conflicted with Newton because Newton was the established theory at the time. The germ theory of disease was considered a pseudoscience at first because it was seemed kind of crazy at the time. We didn't know that little tiny organisms like German bacteria existed when the germ theory of disease was first proposed. People thought that idea that there's little invisible organisms, little invisible beings um, down there that make you sick, that that's what makes you sick. People kind of thought that was crazy at first because it cut against the grain, right? Uh, and so we can't just tell by looking because sometimes, well, because that involves just saying, well, it's not conventional wisdom. Well, sometimes the conventional wisdom is wrong. And second, in general, humans are just really bad at looking and knowing. We're just, we're not very, we're not nearly as good at looking and knowing than we think we are. Our senses, our memory, and especially our instinctive reasoning, or especially important for this is our instinctive reasoning, are not nearly as reliable as we think they are. And many mistakes we make create and feed medical pseudoscience. So for example, so as a kind of illustration that we're just not good at looking at knowing, this isn't really applied directly to medical pseudoscience, but I like this example as an illustration of how easily our senses can be led astray and what we think is obviously true isn't. Um, look at the picture of the strawberries here, right? Um, clearly it's a little fuzzy image, the image is kind of fuzzy, um, but uh, obviously those strawberries are red, right? Like, I mean, you know, Nothing could be more obviously true. Um, those three that are cut, you can see the white insides there, right? But obviously those, those strawberries are red. Well, of course, if you know what, where I'm going here, right? They still look red here, right? This is the same picture, just blown up a little bit. But it's it, look at the bar at the bottom, right? Look at the bar and you can see that that looks red and you can see that redness that goes up. It matches that, that color inside that bar is the same in that strawberry and you can follow it all the way down. So the, this bar is the same color as that strawberry. We can see that. Well, guess what? That bar is gray. And I'm not switching to another slide. This is the same slide. I'm just putting up a white, basically white blank picture in front of it. That bar is gray. Those strawberries are all gray, but we interpret them as red because of expectation bias. We we expect them to be red, and so our brain interprets them as red, uh, even though there's actually no, not a single red pixel in that picture. It's all gray, right? Our perception is constructive. We construct, we perceive the world as we expect to see it. Other assumptions and that kind of stuff uh, go into how we see the world, um, but our perception is constructive, and so our senses are not nearly as reliable as we think. Another good example, there was a study that was done where they showed um, long, I think these are long x-rays, I think. 
uh, no, they're like I, I forget exactly what the what the um, what the uh, the study was showing him. It's not X-rays. That doesn't look like an X-ray to me. But I, I'm again, I'm not a medical professional. I don't do those kind of nuances. But they showed him these um, these pictures, the, these uh, internal pictures of lungs, asking the uh, people to look for. Um, to look for uh, cancer, like they want to look for, you know, uh, signs of cancer and that kind of stuff. And they did pretty good finding the ones that were cancerous were not, but everybody who looked at them missed the gorilla, not everybody, but a number of people who looked at them missed the gorilla that was actually imposed uh, inside the image itself. Um, and uh, th what they were trying to, you know, demonstrate is expectation bias here, um, because they weren't expecting to see something like a little tiny digital gorilla uh, inside these pictures. They just failed to see it. They just skipped right over it. Their brain just filtered uh, it out. So again, our perception is not nearly as reliable as we think it is. Neither is our memory. When we, the way memory works is that when something happens, we kind of store the basics but leave the details out. Upon recall, we pull back up those basics, but we make up some details to fill in, uh, uh, to fill stuff in with what kind of makes sense. And then we store it again, but sometimes those details that we made up can get mixed in there. When we recall it again, we're not recalling the first time it ha happened, we're recalling our last recollection, which means that some of the details we mixed in there that we confabulated could get mixed in with the memory. We might think it's legitimate. The more we do this, the less accurate the memory becomes. Um, and so this is why, if you watch a movie, if you haven't watched a movie for a few years and you go back and watch it again, it may not, the plot may not go like you remembered. Certain scenes may be different than you thought. Um, this is just the inaccuracy of memory. In fact, uh, memory is greatly affected by expectation, so much so that eyewitnesses are not actually that reliable uh, in the courtroom. Uh, it's very easy to cast out on an eyewitness testimony because they get all the details wrong. Um, and our memory is very selective. We recall what's memorable, naturally, what's memorable we'll, we'll more easily remember, um, like when something works, but we'll forget when it doesn't. Uh, and that can lead us astray. That can make, make us think something works more than it actually does. Um, the thing I wanna concentrate on, so that's our, our senses of memory are not nearly as reliable. Usually though, when we're kind of, you know, trying to look and know whether or not something pseudoscience, we're using intuitive reasoning. Um, the problem is that intuitive reasoning is not as reliable as we think it is either. It very easily leads us astray. A number of ways it do this, does this or reasons it does this is like evidence denial. We just have a kind of bias in us. We are apt to deny evidence if it doesn't tell us what we want it to tell us. We'll either literally ignore it, we'll just shove it aside and not read it, or we'll make excuses for why the evidence is not actually good evidence, even though it actually is good evidence. We'll try to excuse it away in some way. Um, subjective validation, validation can lead us astray. Uh, we can make subjective evidence confirm whatever we want it to confirm. Um, this works with Nostradamus. Nostradamus has really, really uh, vague things that he says. and You can kind of read into them what you want to read into them and make it seem like he was predicting World War II when he really wasn't. He was just speaking vaguely. Um, uh, blonde lot and the in rays. Uh, look that up, blonde lot and in rays, and you'll see how subjective validation was at play in there. The way it plays out in medicine is that, um, you know, whether the medicine works often has to do with how you're feeling. Do you feel better, right? Um, and well, that's a completely subjective state of mind. Uh, and so you can interpret yourself as feeling better when you're not actually better. Or if you're a doctor, you could interpret your patients as feeling better uh, when they're not actually better, right? Um, and so uh, that can lead us astray in terms of whether or not something works. Um, confirmation bias. We are apt to we are apt to try to only prove our hypothesis true uh, and not actually try to prove it false. And that is a recipe for self delusion. Uh, long story short, uh, anybody can find evidence for anything, any claim you could find some evidence for. Um, if that's all you do, you can fool yourself into thinking that something is true when it's not. I can find you some evidence that Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer is real. There are songs written about him. Um, what you've got to do is try to prove your hypothesis false, right? Um, if you only try to prove your hypothesis true and you do, that's not surprising. That's not an indication that, that it's true. Anybody can do that. If you try to prove your hypothesis false but can't, that is a good indication that it's true if you've honestly tried to prove it false, but can't. Um, I have an article on confirmation bias. If you're interested, um, you can take a look there. Um, that tells you a little bit more about why we have to do this and why it's, why it's a fallacy and how, how it so often leads us astray. Um, there's availability error. 
Uh, we only pay attention to easily seeable evidence when something like, for example, when something works uh, and we don't pay attention to when it doesn't, right? So we'll remember the cases when the medicine we gave our patients works uh, or the medicine, the alternative treatment that we, you know, we use when we got better after using it or whatever, we'll forget the times that, you know, we didn't, right? Um, then there's the representative heuristic. This is also called the like causes like fallacy. Uh, this is the idea that uh, like things must go together. So this fallacy, the like causes like fallacy, fuels things like uh, the, the idea that rhino horn can be ground up and ingested as a male aphrodisiac. I don't mean to be lewd, uh, but essentially what's going on here is the idea is like, look at that horn, it's long and hard and stiff. Well, that means if I grind it up and ingest it in some way, it will make me long and hard and stiff. Like that's that's literally the idea. And that's why the rhino is going extinct in places because it's being harvested, its horn is being harvested as a male aphrodisiac. So again, one of the harms of pseudoscience. The deer antler spray stuff is using the same kind of thing. Deer antler, right, is like, it's, it's, it's hard, right? It's strong, it's robust, it's hard to break, right? Uh, uh, deer, deer antler is very strong. And so the idea here is that, well, if I can figure out the kind of component in it and I ingest it, I can be strong and hard like the deer antler. So that's why bodybuilders and kind of that kind of stuff like the deer antler spray. Um, this kind of like causes like fallacy leads to something called proportionality bias that also fuels conspiracy theories and conspiracy theories and medical pseudoscience uh, go hand in hand a lot of times. Um, the idea here is that big events need big causes. So this is why, for example, um, the JFK assassination is surrounded by conspiracy theories. There's all kinds of conspiracy theories about what was really going on with the JFK assassination. The Reagan assassination attempt has no conspiracy theories around it. None. Why? Because it wasn't successful. If it had been, if Reagan had been successfully assassinated, there'd be conspiracy theories about it galore. But literally the only difference between a successful conspiracy theory and not is like the gun was here versus here right? Um, and if the gun was here and he missed, oh, you don't need a conspiracy. If it was here and he hit him, you do. Uh, no, you don't. Um, if a conspiracy theory is not necessary to invoke why he missed, it wouldn't be necessary to, 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 be, to invoke, to explain while he was able to hit him. Um, and so we'll see a little bit more about conspiracy theories when we talk about pandemic. Uh, this is one of my favorites. Intuitive reasoning leads us astray in the sense that we are really bad at mistaking what the odds are. Um, we, we cannot intuitively gauge what the probability of certain things actually are. Our intuitions about probability are notoriously bad. My favorite example of this is the birthday paradox. So if I were to say, if we have 23 people in a room, what are the chances that two of them share a birthday, right? The intuitive answer is really low because there's only 23 people, but there's 365 days in a year. So the chances should essentially be 23 out of 365, uh, whatever that is, right? They would be like, you know, one in 30, one in 40, one in 50, like it'd be really low probability um, that, uh, uh, that two people in a room of 23 people would share the same birthday, right? Um, if I told you if we had like 60 people in the room, what are the chances that two of them will still, that's only 60 people. There's 365 days in a year. The chances would still be really, really low. They'd be like one in 30 or one in 20 or something like that, right? Wrong. If you got 23 people, the chances that two of them share a birthday are one in two. It's 50% likely, right? You got 60 people in the same room. It is a near guarantee. I would bet you any amount of money in a room of 60 people that two of them share a birthday. It's like 99.9% .9 probable right? Um, the reason why is because it's not about the number of people in the room. It's actually about the number of possible pairs. Uh, and there's a lot of possible, there's a lot more than 60 pairs, uh, possible pairs of people in a room of 60 people. Um, and so that's why the probability works that way. Here's a graph that actually shows that right here. You see, we reach 50% at 23 people and at 60 people, it's a near guarantee. Um, and so uh, the point here is, is that we are just really bad at intuiting how likely things are. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, another example of this is like, so we might think that a healing miracle is unlikely uh, when actually it's not. So in other words, um, if somebody has cancer and it goes into remission, um, we might think, well, that's really unlikely and therefore you have to invoke a miracle to explain it. No, it's not that unlikely or to make it more directly related to pseudoscience, 
if someone's got cancer, they're taking an alternative treatment for that cancer, and then their cancer goes into remission, we might think, oh, what are the odds of that happening? That's really unlikely. The alternative treatment must work. No, that's not actually unlikely at all. For example, if the chances of cancer remission are one in a thousand, which that's a pretty generous number, right? Uh, let's say that they're one in a thousand. Um, then there are then there were 1,600 remissions last year because there were 1,600,000 cancer cases last year, right? So if there were 1,600 remissions last year, well, chances are, odds are, at least a few of those people were using alternative treatments, right? People with cancer can be desperate, so they'll try anything. So probably a great number of those 1,600 people were trying alternative treatments, right? Uh, and so it's not surprising at all when you find examples and even numerous examples of people who were taking alternative treatments and then their cancer went, went into remission. Cancer goes into remission all the time, right? Uh, and so it can definitely happen in conjunction with alternative treatments, even though those alternative treatments do absolutely nothing, right? Um, so odds are that at least a few of those people that went into remission were using alternative treatments. That does not prove that the alternative treatment actually works. Another way that we're, we're, we're a good example of mistaking the odds in the medical field is this. So suppose the breast cancer rate among 40 year old females is one in a hundred. So one out of every 140 year olds has breast cancer. Let's assume that. Uh, that's probably a pretty high estimate, but this is just for the sake of example. It's probably lower. And if it's lower, this example gets even more like pronounced um, in terms of like its lesson. Um, Suppose a breast cancer test is 80% sensitive and 90% specific. What that means for you non-medical professionals is that 80% of the time, if the patient has cancer, the test would be positive. And then 90% of the time, if the patient doesn't have cancer, the test will be negative. And that's pretty good as tests go. That's a, that's a pretty accurate test, uh, pretty accurate test in terms of the way that cancer test goes, right? So suppose a 40 year old woman test positive, she goes in and gets test for, test for cancer, the test ca comes back positive. What are the odds that she has breast cancer? Intuitive reasoning will tell you 80%, right? At least between 80 and 90%, right? Like maybe you're not sure which one of these numbers is the more important one, right? But at, you know, at best it's 80%, at worst it's like she's like 90% likely uh, uh, to, to have cancer because the test came back positive, right? Um, the answer actually, is 8%, not 80%, 8%. It is only 8% likely that this woman who tested positive for cancer actually has cancer. Now, why is that? Well, there we go. If we had 1,000 women and the rate is one in 100, 10 of those 1,000 women would have cancer, right? And you can see them on the right here. Those are the 10 women who have breast cancer out of those 1,000, right? Because it is 80% uh, of the time, if they have it, it will come back positive. Well, that means 20% of the time when they have it, it'll come back negative. So there's going to be eight true positives out of those 10, but there's going to be two false negatives. That's unfortunate, right? But you'll have eight true positives, right? But since 90% of the time it comes back negative when you are negative, that means 10% of the time when you actually are negative, it will come back positive. That means 10% of that thousand essentially is going to come back with but roughly 10% is gonna come back with a false positive, right? That's 99 false positives are gonna come back out of that thousand people and only eight true positives, right? So only eight of the 107 women who tested positive actually have cancer. That's only 10.5%, right? So essentially a positive breast cancer uh, 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 screening in this scenario raises the probability that you have breast cancer from one in 100 from the base rate to 7.5%. So 1% to 7.5%. Um, that's why you would not conclude that you have cancer based on one positive test. You need to do some follow-up, you need to do a biopsy, that kind of stuff. So one of the ways that patients are led astray or the common person is led astray into believing in pseudoscience um, is through personal experience. They would say something like, after I took Vaxidrin, I'm just making up a drug here. After I took Vaxidrin, uh, I felt better. Therefore, Vaxidrin must work. Or some kind of testimonial. After somebody I knew took Vaxidrin, they felt better. Therefore, Vaxidrin must work. This line of reasoning is fallacious and it fails to appreciate three things. First, the variable nature of illness. Illnesses affect uh, people in different ways. 
Uh, did you get better because you took Vaxidrin or were you already on the men? Even cancer can spontaneously go into remission as we've discussed. Uh, and so the mere fact that you took something and then got better doesn't necessarily mean it made you better. You might've already been on the mend, for example. Of course, it also neglects the placebo effect. People can feel better simply because they expect to feel better uh, because they think Vaxidrin works. Um, and of course, overlook causes. People are also doing other things while they're taking pills or taking treatments or whatever. If we are just looking at one case, we can't tell whether it was the Vaxidrin that made them better or if it was something else that made them better. Uh, so these are things that your patients will often overlook uh, and, and thinking that in, in kind of fallaciously concluding that an alternative medicine is legitimate. Well, it turns out that these same mistakes can be made by doctors uh, to think that a medicine works when it doesn't, right? A doctor might think, well, I gave Vaxidrin to my patient and then they got better. Well, then it must work. Professionals are people too, subject to biases just like everybody else. All the same mistakes that lead your patients astray can lead you astray. Uh, and so we have to be careful to guard against those same mistakes. So. Even now, to, to be clear, a case study, a number of a successful case studies of people getting better after they took something might be a reason to do a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial on that treatment, but not until that trial is successful and then is successfully repeated, would you be able to conclude that it actually works. So case studies might be a reason to, to study a treatment, but they cannot prove a treatment works. Only a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial can prove that a treatment works. So even physicians should ask about their patients, are they really better or do I, or did they just think I think so because I or they expected them to get better? Are you only remembering the people who felt better after taking back children, but forgetting the ones who didn't? Did you consider other possible explanations for why they got better? Did you look for evidence that it doesn't work? Might they be denying that evidence or excusing it away? Uh, did you or they misresemble, misremember how badly they felt in the first place? And so you're kind of you're misremembering how, how much better they feel now, right? These are all mistakes that just you know regular doctors can make. So I've now tried to convince you that it's important to be able to detect pseudoscience. All right, so now I'm gonna to try to teach you to do so. There's two ways that you can do it. There's a long way and there's a short way. Um, I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on the long way because it would take too long. Um, I'm gonna give you a book that could maybe help out with this. The long way essentially is understanding how science is done and being able to recognize good scientific reasoning versus bad scientific reasoning. And then you take a pseudo, you know, you take something that appears to be pseudoscience or not and you apply it and you see if it meets the scientific criteria. Now. So those criteria are, so science is based, all based at, at, in its core on inference to the best explanation, a method of reasoning called inference to the best explanation, where you take multiple hypotheses and weigh them according to criteria to figure out which one is the best. You accept the hypothesis that adheres to the most of the criteria of adequacy. What are those criteria? Well, here you go. Uh, testability or falsifiability. Does it make observable predictions? Um, if it doesn't, then it's probably not scientific. Can nothing count against it like acupuncture? Uh, we'll talk about that, how, how supposedly nothing can count against it in a minute. Um, then it's non-falsifiable. That's probably a pseudoscience. Um, is it, are its predictions correct or not, right? Um, if homeopathy worked, it should do better than placebos in, in placebo-controlled trials. It doesn't, and so it doesn't get the, the hypothesis, it doesn't get the, the predictions uh, correct. But fruitfulness is making successful predictions. Scope is explanatory power. How much does the hypothesis explain or increase our understanding? It shouldn't make, raise more questions than it answers specifically if those questions are unanswerable. It's okay to raise some questions if they're at least potentially answerable, but if it's raising unanswerable questions, then that's, that's a bad sign. Uh, acupuncture is kind of like this. Uh, you know, how does chi work and that kind of stuff? Uh, it's all kind of a, it's all kind of a mystery, right? Um, simplicity. How many entities does the hypothesis require? Are they necessary? Are there other explanations without them? The more entities and assumption a hypothesis requires, the less simple it is and the less, uh, the less adequate it is, uh, and thus the less scientific it will be. Uh, like, Chi and acupuncture is, is kind of an extra assumption you have to make um, that uh, suggests that it is pseudoscientific. And then conservatism doesn't cohere with what we already have good reason to, to know is true. Uh, like homeopathy, uh, we know that diluting something does not reverse and increase its effects, it actually makes its effects. 
uh, less. And so if it violates these criteria, those are the criteria of adequacy. What you can do is learn how to apply those, learn to figure out how to, how to detect those and compare hypotheses. And then you just do the work yourself to figure out whether or not something is pseudoscience. Um, a really good book in this regard is called uh, Ted Chick and, and Louis Vaughn's How to Think About Weird Things. They lay all of this out uh, in grandiose detail. Um, and so if you want to learn how to detect science the long way by detecting, you know, just being able to tell whether it's good science, uh, I highly suggest that. So we can realize that something is pseudoscientific if it's unfalsifiable, if nothing can count as evidence against it, or if its practitioners always dismiss or ignore any evidence against it. If it's not fruitful, its predictions are wrong, then it's probably pseudoscience. Um, if it's a medical treatment, then it should do significantly better than a placebo in a double-blind study. If it doesn't, then it doesn't work. Um, if it has no scope, if it raises unanswerable questions or says it explains everything, then it doesn't really explain anything. If it's not simple, if it invokes new unknown forces for which it has no evidence. Um, if it's not conservative, if it would require us to ignore or think wrong things we already have really good reason to believe are true, then it's probably pseudoscience. And if it does all of these things, it is definitely pseudoscience. Um, if you would like to, uh, another place that you could go for the kind of basics of how to do this kind of, uh, to do inference to the best explanation, I have an article on diagnosis and inference to the best explanation. This shows you how to apply inference to the best explanation to, to medical diagnosis, but also just kind of teaches you how to do it uh, in general. Um, so that's the kind of long method uh, for, uh, for doing it. You have this kind of laborious task of learning exactly how to do science and how to recognize it. And then you should apply those lessons um, to pseudoscience. But there's also a shortcut method. The shortcut method is you look for red flags. You look for the kind of common things that pseudoscience, pseudoscience does, and that puts your skeptical hackles up um, and maybe don't waste your time uh, uh, you know, on it or whatever. Like you don't have to do a lot of research on it because you see a quite, a quite a few red flags and so you just can kind of set it aside, right? Um, these might be helpful for doctors and their patients because when they bring a pseudoscience into, the, into their practice, they can say, that sounds like pseudoscience because it's doing this and this and this, and those are the kinds of things that pseudoscience, uh, pseudoscientific, uh, those kind of things that pseudoscientific claims usually do, right? So to kind of close here, it, it's, it, there's quite a few, but I'm gonna go over some red flags for identifying pseudoscience. So testimonials, if it relies primarily or only on testimonials for evidence, it's likely a pseudoscience. Um, Kevin Trudeau's natural cures they don't want you to know about. That's mostly just testimonials of people saying, I had X, I took Y, I, I felt better afterwards, so uh, Y cures X. Um, that, is, that is pseudoscience. If it's untested, if it's not clear which or how tests were done, um, if, if there's no mention of the test that they mentioned being replicated, right? So we did a test, but they don't see like this was replicated in other ways and we, our, our results were confirmed. If you see things like in one study, 90% of subjects saw improvements. Um, one study is not enough. Saw improvements is way too vague. Um, you need to be a lot more specific and have a lot more studies than that. Um, also, when you see things like this, like drawings, like whoever has this colon should be dead right? Like there's, this is not an actual picture of somebody really in a condition uh, uh, that actually has a, a, has a condition like this, right? So um, you see like kind of artistic drawings of health conditions. Like if it, this is really a condition, you should be able to actually find an actual picture of something like this, right? Uh, not just have to do a drawing of it. Um, it's ancient. Uh, there has been no progress or advancement over the years. It's based on ancient knowledge. Uh, science progresses as evidence uh, comes in. When new evidence comes in, it updates itself. That's what good science does. If you have not seen that in whatever uh, uh, you're, you're investigating, um, if it's been around for a long time and hasn't really changed, uh, that's a good reason to think that it's probably pseudoscience. Uh, if there's bias, uh, do they stand to make money or have a political religious agenda? Uh, that would be a good reason to think uh, that it's pseudoscience. Dianetics is like this. Uh, vaccine denial is like this, specifically Wakefield. Andrew Wakefield, who published that first uh, paper that suggested that vaccines cause autism, turns out he was de he did not disclose this, but he was developing a, an alternative to the MMR vaccine. So that's why he was trying to cast doubt on the MMR vaccine. Uh, Anti-GMO places are usually trying to sell you organic foods and supplements and that kind of stuff. 
Um, so if there's a bias, they've, they stand to make money, that kind of stuff, uh, that's a pretty good indication that you're working with the pseudoscience. Um, if they have no qualifications, those making the claims have no legitimate or appropriate pedigree, that's probably you're dealing with the pseudoscience. Airborne, this dietary supplement that's supposed to be like, it's basically a mega dose kind of vitamin thing, supposed to bo boost your immune system. It was developed by a teacher, I believe an elementary teacher. Um, they are not an immunologist, they're not a medical expert. They don't have the expertise to be developing this. Um, the copper rod cold treatment was developed by a social psychologist, not a medical professional. So that's a reason to think that it's pseudoscience. If you see a bunch of hokey marketing, infomercials, people in lab coats, celebrity endorsements, celebrity testimonials, name droppings about certifications and colleges, et cetera, um, that's probably a pseudoscience. Goop's in-house research scientists are a huge red flag uh, in, in, in terms of it being a pseudoscience. Um, yeah, I would say check out the Netflix documentary, don't. Um, if you wanna see pseudoscience, that's a good place to go. But if it's popularized, if it was first announced or popularized on mass media instead of, pseudo, in, instead of through scientific channels, that's a good indication that you're working with pseudoscience. Kinesio tape uh, and cupping were both uh, popularized at different Olympic games. Uh, people had not heard about this until they saw these athletes using it, right? Um, the Kinesio tape was actually a stunt. The people who ran the Kinesio tape industry, uh, who owned it or whatever, made, stood to make a lot of money off of it, sent a bunch of free Kinesio tape to all these, uh, uh, you know, these Olympic athletes. And they figured, you know, what would it hurt to try it? And so they put all this colorful tape all over them, especially the, you know, the half naked volleyball players. And right, everybody saw it and started asking questions about it. And so a bunch of people started using it. Um, that is not a good indication that it actually works, right? Uh, that's a good indication that athletes are easily fooled by pseudoscience. Um, if you see a bunch of jargon, scientific language that sounds scientific, uh, but isn't, uh, usually it just sounds impressive, uh, but it actually means nothing. Applied kinesiology is good at this, uh, not only in like the way they present uh, their science here, we see this kind of look scientific until you look at it a little bit closer and you kind of realize that there's really nothing going on here. Um, but also like the, the name itself, applied kinesiology, right? Kinesiology is real science. Right? Well, they took that name and put the word applied to it to make themselves sound scientific when they're not. Right? So that's what I mean by using scientific sounding language to make it seem like something scientific when it's not. Then there's also vague language uh, that can't be tested and is subject to suggestion. So the deer antler spray advertisements will say things vague like enhances performance and improves recovery. Um, what does that mean? What kind of performance? How in the world would you possibly test that? You really can't, right? Um, often this is uh, one of the reasons they do this is because they can't be sued. Because if you make false medical claims, you can be sued, right? Enhances performance and improves recovery is so vague, it can't really be tested, which means that you can't be sued for saying it doesn't do the thing that you're claiming it does because you're really not claiming it does anything, right? Like anything specific. Um, Right, so they get in trouble if you could test it because you could test it and see that it doesn't do that thing so they couldn't claim that anymore. So they make these vaguer claims so they can't be sued. Well, the fact they have to make such vague claims is a giant red flag that you're dealing with the pseudoscience. Um, it's also a celebrity endorsement there from, from, Roy, from Roy Williams, which is again, it's another red flag. Extra entities, uh, if it invokes energy fields or other unverified entities or powers or substances or whatever, in order for it to work, um, that would make it non-simple, right? And so that's kind of a red flag uh, for thinking that it's pseudoscience. Not always germs are extra entities and that panned out, but it panned out because the germ theory of disease, even though it was non-simple compared to other things, was more fruitful, was, was testable, more fruitful, wide scoping and conservative than the competing hypotheses. And so it won out, right? Um, but if it's invoking extra fields, like that's a big giant red flag. And unless it overcomes that by being more adequate in other ways, you're dealing with the pseudoscience. Acupuncture in chi is like this. That's an extra assumption. Uh, homeopathy. Homeopathy says that it works because the, you, so you take a substance that causes a symptom, you dilute it out of existence. And then the diluted substance, like the diluted concoction uh, uh, at the end, which is just water, uh, will have the curative properties. Um, it will have the properties to cure what the original substance caused. Um, they, to explain how that works, they have to say that substances have essences and that water can remember the essence of the substance that it once contained. So in order for homeopathy to work, you have to assume that substances have essences, that's one assumption, and that water can remember things. That's another assumption. Uh, clearly that makes it less simple. Uh, and so it, that is a big giant red flag for pseudoscience. 
Um, if they claim suppression, if they make enemies out of their critics, uh, does it claim to be suppressed by the authorities and experts? Um, that's a red flag for pseudoscience. Does it do ad hominem attacks? It attacks the experts rather than their theory. And then rather than actually providing evidence for the pseudoscientific theory, they just spend their time attacking the experts and not even their, you know, their claims. Um, then that's a red flag for pseudoscience. Um, Plandemic does this a bunch. They, they attack uh, Dr. Fauci or whatever, um, but they really don't provide any kind of good evidence for the claims that they're making. Uh, they claim that they're being suppressed by Fauci and real medical science or whatever. Does it make virtue out of ignorance? And this might sound, sound silly, but people really do this, right? Like they will say, well, I can see the truth because I wasn't brainwashed by a university education. I didn't go to a university and, and get the, you know, the scientific view and brainwash me into, put, put me into a box into thinking the way things had to be so I can see the real truth because I'm not educated. Um, they make a virtue out of ignorance. Got somebody doing that, pseudoscience. Um, homeopathy will do this. They claim to be you know, attacked by the mainstream. Uh, any homeopaths watching this video will claim that I'm attacking them um, and uh, that I'm paid off by whoever for whatever, whatever to, to cast doubt in them or whatever. They'll, they'll claim that they're being suppressed by experts and that kind of stuff. Nope, I'm presenting an argument uh, for, for why it's uh, pseudoscientific. Again, Plandemic uh, uh, does this, makes uh, enemies out of its critics. Um, I have an article called uh, on the Galileo Gambit. The Galileo Gambit is this fallacy where people claim like the, the argument is like Galileo was criticized by the authorities and he turned out to be right. Your critic, the authorities are criticizing me. Well, I must be right too. That's the Galileo gambit. And that is completely fallacious. Yeah, they laughed at Galileo when they turned out to be right, but they also laughed at Bozo the Clown. And there's a lot more Bozos out there than there are Galileos. If they don't lack expertise, but have false expertise. So do people making the claim exaggerate or lie about their qualifications um, and make it seem like they're, 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 like they're qualified when they're not? So Plandemic claims that Judy Mikovits is one of the most accomplished scientists of her generation. And she thinks the Plandemic is a big hoax and that the virus came out of the lab in Wuhan and was, you know, was created there, et cetera, et cetera. In reality, her only accomplishment was being one minor author. She worked in the lab on a 2009 paper that would have been revolutionary if it had been if it had been replicable, but it wasn't, and it was eventually retracted. And it turned out that there were contaminated samples. Like that's her big claim to fame. She is not one of the most accomplished scientists of her generation. Um, and so, would you see claims like that? People over exaggerating their qualifications. Red flag. Probably dealing with pseudoscience. Uh, there's also tooth fairy science. This is also called cargo cult science. Um, it's performing science adjacent studies or documentaries or that kind of stuff that kind of look scientific, but aren't actually scientific. Um, the reason it's called like tooth fairy science get, gets this name, like think about like somebody to prove, somebody might perform a study about how much money the tooth fairy leaves for each study and like do a mathematical analysis and figure out on average how much the tooth fairy leaves and then say, I've got proof the tooth fairy exists, look at this study. That study is, does not actually prove the tooth fairy exists, right? That study assumes the tooth fairy exists and then does some mathy stuff um, to, make it look, you know, to make it look impressive or whatever, but it, that's not really a study that, the to, you know, that shows the tooth fairy exists. Um, a study, this is something that happens in pandemic, right? A study about whether doctors think hydrochloroquine is, a, is promising as a treatment for COVID doesn't prove that it's a cure for COVID, but that's the evidence that pandemic presents for thinking hydrochloroquine uh, is, a, is, a, is a cure, right? Is a bunch of doctors think it's promising. Uh, well, A, they don't think that anymore, but even if they did, which they did maybe back when the survey was taken, that's not proof that it works. You need a double-blinded study for that, right? Um, the reason it's also called cargo cult science is because of these things that propped up after World War II on these Pacific islands. This is kind of a fun story. Um, there were these islands in the Pacific and the, like the US military built bases there. And so they had runways and huts, or not huts, they had buildings with radios in them and they would radio in for supplies and then airplanes would come in and deliver supplies. Well, after the war was gone and the military left, the people who lived on these islands, right, these kind of pre-scientific people that lived on these islands, thought this was remarkable. And so they built little makeshift runways and little huts with things that kind of look like radios and they made sounds into them expecting food and supplies to drop in from the sky, right? And so these cargo cults were doing something that kind of looked like what the military was doing, expecting the same results, right? Uh, and so that's why anything that kind of mimics what something looks like is often called a cargo cult. 
Um, and so cargo cult science is stuff that kind of looks like science, but is it really science? Um, another thing that we see is no humility in pseudoscientists. When their theory is unconservative, when it conflicts with established fact or expert consensus, they don't consider the possibility that they're wrong. And instead they jump right to, well, I know better than everyone else. If all the experts are, 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 are disagree with me, it can't be that I'm wrong and all these other people are right. They say, all oh, these other people are wrong and I'm the only one that's right. There's no humility in that. Uh, you're wrong is much more likely than you're revolutionary. Um, this is something that, uh, uh, that they did uh, in pandemic with the out of Wuhan, the out of Wuhan lab theory uh, for COVID. All the experts agreed that it definitely wasn't genetically engineered. It has no markers for genetic engineering, but it also didn't come out of the lab because A, it's too dissimilar to the viruses that actually are being studied in the lab or were being studied in the lab, um, are, and, are, studied, are being studied and were being studied. Um, and there are cases outside of Wuhan before it was discovered in Wuhan now. Like it was first discovered in Wuhan, like that's when we first saw it, but we've done more research then and saw that there were cases outside of Wuhan even before that. Um, it looks like what's going on is the reason that it was discovered in Wuhan is not because it started there, but because the Wuhan lab was in Wuhan. And so they had the resources to finally actually identify it, right? Um, it was other places first, but they didn't see it there because they didn't have a lab to be able to do the hard work of identifying this new virus. Um, the, the approach that you should take is what they took at the opera, with the opera particle detector. Uh, long story short, uh, the opera particle detector, the scientists working there thought they initially had like their evidence, they ran an experiment and their, their experiment showed that neutrinos travel faster than the speed of light. That's contrary to Einstein. They did not conclude, we know better than everybody else. We've overturned Einstein. They had humility. They said, that's pretty, that's pretty grandiose. That goes against a lot of evidence that we have maybe our experiment is wrong. And so they presented their results to the scientific community and invited people to find a problem with their experiment. And eventually one was found. Um, there was basically a, a measuring a problem with their measuring device. Once corrected, the neutrinos were not traveling faster than light. If you see a lot of alarmism, uh, like if you see people saying uh, all food is poison and so we should all be dead, like the anti-GMO people claim, uh, are doctors trying to keep you sick because they want your money, um, like natural home remedies and that kind of stuff? Uh, do they manipulate emotions instead of presenting you with evidence like this image on the right here does um, with Franken foods and that kind of stuff? That kind of alarmism is a, is a pretty good indication that you're dealing with the pseudoscience. Is it too good to be true? Is there no limit to what it can do? Like uh, Walt and Sar like uh, water and sea salt cures, uh, chiropractic, some versions of chiropractic claim to be able to like heal basically everything. Energy manipulation claims to be able to heal basically any anything. Um, if it claims to be a cure-all, it likely cures nothing, right? Uh, no actual scientific medicine is a curative for everything. Um, if they make excuses, so if the if the pseudoscientists or the people defending the claim uh, make ad hoc excuses to save itself from the evidence, an ad hoc excuse is an, a, a, a test, uh, an excuse that can't be falsified. Um, if it's non-falsifiable, then it's probably dealing with the pseudoscience. So for example, when acupuncture um, was being addressed on the Dr. Oz show, Dr. Stephen Novella, uh, who's a Yale neuroscientist who actually runs science-based medicine and a number of the links you've seen so far linked to certain uh, science-based medicine articles. Um, he observed that like acupuncture does no better than placebos, right? Like you can take a study and do real acupuncture and then you can do fake acupuncture where you put the needles in non acupuncture points and then you can do complete placebo acupuncture where you just do this to people with no needles you just poke them like they're being poked but you're not actually putting in and you you look at the different groups there's no difference between those groups well then acupuncture doesn't work right if it worked it should do better than placebo uh, the, the, a placebo in a controlled blinded trial it doesn't so it doesn't work, right? Well, Dr. Oz would say, and he did say like, well, ac acupuncture can't be tested by Western techniques because it's not a Western medicine. Uh, no, there's nothing Western about a placebo, double-blinded placebo controlled trial, right? If a treatment works, then it works. It should do better than a placebo in a placebo controlled trial, right? Uh, the idea that it can't be tested by Western techniques is an excuse that you've made up to get yourself out of the evidence that it doesn't work, right? Or sometimes they'll say it can only be tested as part of an entire treatment program. So, you know, when you when you do a double blind test, you isolate the treatment, right? Or well, does it work and say, oh, that's because you took it out of this whole treatment program. Well, there's no way you can test the whole treatment program like that. That makes it untestable. Uh, and that's so that's your excuse to get out of the evidence. So if you see these kind of ad hoc excuses, that's a pretty good indication that you're dealing with pseudoscience. Um, in fact, 
if it's been on Dr. Oz, that's a red flag, right? That's not a guarantee that it's pseudoscience. There's been some good science on Dr. Oz, but the British Medical Journal found that just 40%, 46% of his claims were supported by any scientific evidence. And usually even then it was just one study. And we all know one study doesn't prove anything. Meanwhile, 36% of what he said, uh, the things promoted were found to have no supporting evidence and 15 were actually contradicted by scientific evidence, right? Um, so again, it doesn't guarantee it, but these are all red flags. None of them are guarantee, but they are a reason to be suspicious, right? So here he is promoting red palm oil, miracle oil for longevity. Uh, here he is, is a miracle fat burner in a bottle. This is raspberry something. Um, uh, coffee bean extract is the answer to weight loss, the paleo diet. Um, and here he is with psychic John Edwards. Can't get more pseudoscientific than that. A medical doctor on stage promoting a psychic as a new therapist? Nope. Um, if it appeals to ignorance, it, it, they say that it's true because it hasn't been proven false. Uh, this is a classic logical fallacy appealing to ignorance. And it is a fallacy because it unfairly shifts the burden of proof. The burden of proof is always on the one making the positive claim. If you have a medicine that you say that you think works, it's your burden to provide the evidence that it does work, not someone's evidence, not someone else's burden to prove that it doesn't work. That is an impossible task to do for everything. Um, if they claim that it's all natural, um, is it all natural? Uh, like pumpkin seed uh, cure-all is, is all natural. Um, that does not mean that it actually works. This is called the appeal to nature fallacy. Uh, thinking that the mere fact that something is natural is a reason to think that it's good. No, many natural things are really bad. Like hemlock, hemlock's all natural. It will kill you. Many unnatural things are good. Glasses. Glasses are completely unnatural. This is completely man-made thing. You don't find these in nature at all. They're awesome, right? I can see because of them, otherwise I wouldn't be able to. GMOs are unnatural, right? But they're really good. They've saved millions of lives. Um, yeah, could go on and on about that. Um, in general, like, so appeal to ignorance was a fallacy in general, if it just commits fallacies. Uh, do they have too small or a biased sample like Wakefield study on autism? Uh, do they commit the causal fallacy? Do they merely think that correlation entails causation? It doesn't. Uh, any testimonial commits this fallacy. Um, I took it, therefore I felt better, therefore it made me better. That's the causal fallacy. Anti-vax thinks this. I took the vaccine, that my kid took the vaccine, then he has autism, one caused the other. No, um, that does not necessarily follow. And in fact, we'll talk about the error uh, that, that, uh, that, that's involved in that in a minute. Do they count the hits and ignore the misses like natural cures, anti-vax? Like anti-vax is a really good example of this, right? They pay attention to the examples where somebody took a vaccine and then was diagnosed with autism. They ignore the hundreds and thousands and millions of other cases where people got vaccines and didn't get autism, right? Um, Obviously, it's right. Like, obviously, it doesn't cause it. If I mean, if it did, it would be happening all the time. It doesn't happen that often. And in fact, there's other explanations for why there's even occasional correlations. Um, do they do data mining? Uh, do they do data misrepresentation, like anti-vax does, uh, or mask denial does this? I'm going to talk about this for a minute. Um, so, how do they misrepresent evidence? So. Dennis Raincourt, to prove that masks don't help prevent the uh, source contamination of COVID-19, in other words, they don't, uh, they don't protect others from infected wearers, um, that should be IE instead of EG, sorry about that. Um, well, he does that. So to, pr to prove that masks don't help prevent source contamination, he cites irrelevant studies about whether N95 masks are as effective as surgical masks at protecting their wearer. Well, protecting their wearer is not how masks help prevent the spread. They, they protect others from the wearer. And so that those kind of studies are irrelevant. He cites multiple of those studies and then claims that that proves his hypothesis. No, it doesn't. He'll say he's reinterpreting those studies to what the, you can't reinterpret a study that way. Studies can only prove what they were designed to prove. Any kind of extrapolation beyond that is pure pseudoscience. He misquotes studies to make it sound like their conclusions are different than they are. Um, he, will, he will think that they are saying that something's ineffective when they're only saying that two things are equally effective. Um, like N95s and surgical masks are equally effective. Say, oh, that means they're ineffective. No, it doesn't. Um, 
he mistakes not powerful enough to find an effect with there is no effect. Anybody who knows anything about double-blinded studies, especially ones that are kind of done in real world circumstances that can't be all the way properly controlled, the mere fact that you can't find an effect doesn't mean the effect is there. It might not be the, it might be that the effect's not there, but it also might be that the study wasn't powerful enough or there are other complications that mean that the effect did not show up or didn't come out in the data. Um, so not powerful enough to find an effect is not the same thing as there is no effect. Um, he would, he left out the parts of certain studies where the authors admit that the study was flawed or may have not been powerful enough to find the effect. He only kind of quotes minds and only quotes the part where they say, we were unable to find an effect and then leaves out the part later where they say, but we might not have been able to find the effect because the power the study wasn't powerful enough, right? Or uh, he mentions a study showed masks led to no reduction for the flu. So they weren't able to find effect in the effectiveness of masks of preventing flu infection for their wares. It doesn't mention that the authors make clear that why their findings about the flu can't be extended to coronaviruses because they're different kinds of viruses or that the study did actually show that masks led to a reduction for SARS-CoV-1, which is the closest thing to COVID SARS CoV 2, right? So, like he's trying to prove that masks don't help spread the, the don't don't help with the spread of COVID-19. And he cites this study that were that found no reduction in the flu. And he only cites that that sentence that says we were unable to find any effect in masks in preventing flu spread. He leaves out the part where they specifically say, but you can't extrapolate from flu to coronaviruses because they're so different. And in fact, our study did find that masks helped with other coronaviruses like SARS-CoV-1, which by the way is the closest thing to SARS-CoV-2, right? That is direct evidence that the masks do actually work. Yeah, he just leaves that part out, right? That giant red flag for pseudoscientists right there, right? If you're more interested in this, this is Rancor's original article. I've got a paper debunking his arguments here. It's about 10,000 10, words long because uh, the mistakes he made were legion. It took a while to explain what all of them were, but a complete debunking can be found there. Um, if they work backwards from their conclusions, uh, it decides beforehand what the conclusion is and then seeks out only evidence to confirm it. They're engaging in confirmation bias, which I talked about before. Again, there's the article. Um, it could also beg the question. Uh, it studies the, the studies they do to prove it actually just assume the truth of what they're trying to prove. Uh, a really good example of this uh, is with homeopathy. Um, homeopathy, homeopathic uh, uh, doctors will do, the doctor's not the right word, sorry, but homeopathic practitioners will do something called a proving to prove something works. And that what that proving consists of is giving someone a substance, substance, observing what symptoms they have, and then just concluding that diluting that substance would cure that symptom. That does not prove that diluting the substance would cure the symptom. That assumes that diluting the substance would, would cure the symptom. You're begging the truth. You're begging the, the begging the truth. You're begging the question. You're assuming the truth of what you're trying to prove there. So if you see this kind of working backwards, uh, uh, begging the question kind of a thing uh, going on, you know that you're dealing, or very likely you're, no, you are dealing with the pseudoscience at that point. That is a huge red flag. If their epistemology is backwards, uh, if their epistemic standards are backwards, so they praise anecdotal evidence, but then say good evidence isn't good enough, like double-blinded studies, that kind of stuff. Or, and this is tricky, sometimes they can misunderstand what evidence is appropriate or the limits of the evidence. So double-blinded studies aren't appropriate for all scientific questions. Um, and so they can cite uh, they could think that they're more relevant than they are and think that the fact that you haven't found a double-blinded study for this is reason to think it works when you really can't have a good double-blinded study for this. Let me elaborate on this for, for a second. Um, so think of it this way. You cannot actually do a genuine, uh, ethically, you cannot do a genuine actual uh, double-blinded study for seatbelts for example, right? If you were to really do a double-blinded placebo-controlled trial for seatbelts, uh, what you would have to do is like have a, a study where you had three groups of people, uh, one that were, ones in cars that were actually in seatbelts, one that weren't wearing seatbelts, and then ones that were kind of, that thought they were wearing seatbelts but weren't, right? Like it wasn't latched in, right? Or, or something like that, or they would just immediately break upon contact or whatever. You have to do it with real people for it to be a really actual, good, completely double-blinded you know, trial. You have to have real people, put them in those circumstances, and then throw them at walls and see how many people died. Obviously, ethically, you can't do that, right? Um, 
And any kind of double-blinded study we, we try to do on that, that use real world conditions, well, real world conditions would be subject to all kinds of variations, all kinds of problems could pop up uh, with those kinds of studies and they might not be able to find an effect, right? Um, all you could really do is like, you know, look at st states before and after they implemented seatbelt laws or states with seatbelt laws and those without, look at mortality rates and that kind of stuff. And that would be good enough to know that seatbelts work, right? Uh, but if you try to do a double-blind study on it, you might not find an effect because of the limits of doing double-blinded studies in the real world uh, when you have ethical constraints on them, um, right? Uh, or, uh, uh, and so somebody might say, well, the fact there's no double-blinded studies that are proper, all the way properly done is, it, it, so therefore seatbelts don't work. That's misunderstanding the appropriate nature of like where double-blinded studies are needed and where they work and where they're not needed and where they can't be done. Uh, another example would be like with bulletproof vests. Um, this is an easier example maybe. Uh, with bulletproof vests, you could not, the only way to do a properly placebo-controlled trial would be to put a bunch of people in a room, give some bulletproof vests, give some other vests that kind of look like they're bulletproof but they weren't, and then start shooting at them and see how many people survive, right? Um, obviously you can't do that. You could do things like, look at soldiers in the real world, which ones are wearing bulletproof vests, look at which ones aren't, and look at the mortality rates in the different platoons with and without bulletproof vests. But even if you weren't able to see a difference, see an effect between those two groups, that wouldn't mean that bulletproof vests don't work because in the real world, there's all kinds of variables that might throw off the results. Maybe the people with the bulletproof vests got thrown into more dangerous situations because they had the bulletproof vests, right? Maybe the people without the bulletproof vests just happened to be in safer situations or were in different situations where they weren't as, you know, as likely, right? Maybe the people with the bulletproof vests were going up against people who were better at headshots and so they couldn't be protected by the vest, right? Like there's all kinds of real world variation in there um, that would mean that that study, you know, the, the fact that you did a, you know, you, you compared these two groups, one with vests and one without, weren't able to find a difference. That doesn't mean that bulletproof vests work. The more relevant data actually comes from physical evidence, like physical experiments where you put bulletproof vests on dummies and you shoot bullets at them and see if the bullets go through. That's what actually proves that they work. And any kind of trial you did out in the real world wouldn't actually be that helpful. It's the same thing with masks. The reason like we know that masks would help if they can catch the particles that contain the virus. So you do the physical studies to see if they do. And if they do, you know they work. And any kind of study you did out in the real world to see if they worked, if it didn't find an effect, it could just as easily be because of real world randomness that threw the, threw the results off and you wouldn't be able to see the effect because of the real world randomness or complications. So it's not recognizing those kinds of things, thinking that double-blinded studies are, are more appropriate for some things when they're not or not recognizing their limits, then you see that you've got a pseudoscience. Or they think that, as a last point here, they think large amounts of bad evidence make good evidence. They think they can stack up a bunch of bad studies and make one good one. That is a giant uh, uh, red flag. Shaky foundations are a red flag if their fundamental principles are based on a single case. A uh, really good example of this is J.D. Palmer's Basics for Chiropractic. One person could hear again after Palmer popped his neck. And so Palmer concluded that that was, uh, that was the cause of all disease was misalignments of the spine, um, subluxations. Um, and so obviously that, that's a red flag for pseudoscience. If they fail to engage with the medical community, the scientific community, um, there's no conferences, there's no peer reviewed publications. Um, good science needs feedback. Right, and so if they're not getting that kind of feedback and they don't engage, um, it's it's probably a pseudoscience. It's probably avoided because they know it wouldn't pass muster, and that's why they avoid it. If you see the pseudoscience in a bad context, do they publish solely on YouTube? Right? Are their arguments promoted on conspiracy theory websites? Now, let, let me go back to YouTube. Right? Somebody being on YouTube doesn't necessarily mean they're a pseudoscientist. I'm on YouTube right now. Hi, YouTube. Right? But that doesn't mean that I'm a pseudoscientist. Right? But I also publish in peer-reviewed journals, right? I teach classes on pseudoscience. I've published some peer-reviewed stuff on science and scientific reasoning and that kind of stuff, right? So I've got other peer-reviewed publications. It's fine for somebody who is an expert to come on YouTube to present arguments and try to reach the public on you. That's fine. But are they only publishing on YouTube? Do they not have peer-reviewed uh, articles, right? Uh, when they merely try to post something on ResearchGate, does it get pulled down because it's considered misinformation by the scientific community, right? Um, 
are the places that you end up finding their arguments right along conspiracy theory websites, right? So Rancourt has this problem, right? Like his anti-mask arguments appear on websites right along articles about conspiracy theories about Bill Gates really being a Nazi and that kind of stuff, right? That's a huge red flag, right? And some people will claim that's an ad hominem. You're attacking the arguer rather than the argument. No, ad, ad hominem is when, first of all, like I've attacked the argument, other people have attacked the argument specifically, but when it comes to matters that require expertise, the reputation of the person giving the argument is relevant. It matters. So if you see somebody and their reputation is tainted, they do not peer review, you find their stuff on crazy conspiracy websites and you know everything else on that website is bunk, that is a giant red flag that you are dealing with someone that does not actually understand the science, right? Uh, that is not an ad hominem. Ad hominem is a very commonly misunderstood uh, 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 fallacy. Uh, ad, uh, it's very common for people who lack credentials to claim that's an ad hominem when you point out the fact that they lack credentials. Nope, your credentials, especially when you're dealing with science, are extremely important. And pointing out that you lack scientific credentials when you are talking about a scientific matter is very relevant to whether the argument you are presenting should be trusted. If the pseudo, if the, if it claims to be decades ahead, if it claims to be decades decades ahead of actual science, it's probably pseudoscience. Great example of this was the human head transplant claims uh, that came around. That is decades beyond. Like there are um, there, there's decades of advancements that we would have to make before we could ever get to doing a successful head transplant, or actually I would call it a body transplant, but um, transplanting one body from another. But anyway. Um, uh, that's a huge red flag if they claim to be decades ahead. If they ignore alternatives, if it fails to consider alternative hypotheses in favor, in favor of non-parsimonious, less simple hypotheses, it's likely a pseudoscience. So do vaccines cause autism because some people got vaccinated and then they were diagnosed with autism? Or is it the case that signs of autism typically present around the time the child is old enough to get vaccinated? So those two things just happen to go together, but one does not cause the other. Obviously that's the simpler explanation that explains why so many people get vaccinated but don't develop autism. And then lastly, p-hacking. This one's kind of complicated. This is arbitrarily selecting when to start or stop data collection when doing a study to guarantee that you get good results, to get results that statistically match the p-value that you were looking for. Uh, so what you're looking for p-value is essentially you want your uh, data, the, the, the likelihood that your data would come out a certain kind of way if the treatment didn't work um, would be like really, really low. It, it would be higher. It would be uh, uh, not like, no, it's only 95% probable. It's only 5% probable that would, that this kind of result would happen by chance if the treatment didn't work. Well, there are ways of manipulating the data, like starting and stopping when you're counting the data to make it look like you've got that, you've hit that value. Oh, the data we're looking at would only, it's only 5% likely that that would happen by chance. Um, there's a way to manipulate the data to, to kind of make it look like that's the case when it's not actually the case. Uh, in easy ways, like you just run your test and you keep track of the p-value until the p-value reaches high enough and then you stop your data collection because further data might bring it back down. You just stop right there and say, I reached my p-value. That's called p-hacking. And so the last thing I wanna mention as a, as, a, as a potential pseudoscience that has crept into real medicine is osteopathic manipulation. Now, let me be very, very, very clear here. Okay, so this is an example of how it can creep into real genuine scientific based medicine, all right? So little history lesson, osteopathic medicine, OM, as it was founded by Andrew Taylor Still in 1874 was a pseudoscience, undoubtedly. It was based in ideas about vital forces. He claimed that by correcting problems in the body structure through the use of manual techniques now known as osteopathic manipulative medicine, the body's ability to function and to heal itself could be greatly improved. But interestingly, as a historical fact here, Unlike chiropractic, osteopathic medicine did not resist scientific correction. And today, a doctor of osteopathic medicine receives basically the same training as an MD and treats patients in basically the same way. In fact, osteopathic medicine has a little bit better tradition of treating the whole patient rather than just diseases. And we're kind of coming around to realizing that that's probably a better, uh, a better approach to medicine, right? So OMs, our DOs kind of have, up, have it up on MDs just in, in a certain kind of way, or at least on a certain, in a certain context, all right? So I'm not bashing DOs, DOs are fine. They receive basically the same treatment, as, same training as an MD, that's fine. Some DOs, however, still practice osteopathic manipulation. 
Osteopathic manipulation looks similar to chiropractic manipulation and its benefits are very difficult to measure. So to what degree a pseudoscience, to what degree osteopathic manipulation is a pseudoscience would make for an interesting presentation itself. I am not an expert on this, so I'm not gonna like venture an opinion on it per se. I will mention for what it's worth that Yale's Stephen Novella at Science-Based Medicine, who's to, who I've linked to a bunch, uh, uh, that, 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 uh, that website I've linked to a bunch in this presentation, is very complimentary of DOs, equating them with MDs, but he has also concluded that the practice of osteopathic manipulation itself has no demonstra demonstrable efficacy. If he's right, this could be a place where pseudoscience has crept into real science, right? Um, osteopathic manipulation. Okay, so that's that. At this point, I would take a Q&A, but of course it's a YouTube video, so I'm not gonna do that. Um, if you are more interested in this topic, um, if you really wanna learn the long way, the, the more kind of exact way to do scientific reasoning, inference of the best explanation, read Ted Schick's How to Think About Weird Things. But if you're interested in this other kind of uh, red flag view and in general, just interested in science and pseudoscience in general, I highly recommend The Skeptic's Guide to the Universe. Stephen Novella is one of the main authors on that, uh, on that book. Um, it is fantastic. I, I use it in my class myself. Itself. It's very good uh, so um, and very informative. There's an audiobook version that's very easy to listen to. I highly encourage you um, to uh, read that. I think Novella actually reads the audiobook version if memory serves. So anyway, so that was my presentation for the Williamsport Hospital Continuing Medical Education Program from April uh, 2nd. I hope you found it informative uh, and helpful. And um, I'll be posting this to YouTube. Of course, it's already posted if you're sitting here watching it, right? So uh, thank you so much uh, and take care.